The advent of trench warfare created unique problems for the nations engaged in the deadlock struggle of the Western Front. While offering great protection against enemy artillery and assault, it proved difficult to then bombard and assault the enemy trenches successfully for the same reasons. This would push each nation to develop tactics and technology to circumvent and overcome the defenses of the enemy, while not opening up their own lines to the same type of exploitation and hopeful breakthrough. One such idea was an airplane that could cruise over enemy trenches and pepper enemy soldiers with machine gun fire. While strafing troops by diving on them or dropping bombs had been a standard of ground attacks, they both had issues with accuracy and concentration of fire. Many nations had toyed with the idea of putting downward-facing guns on the bottom of the aircraft, which would unleash a rain of bullets just by flying directly over any target. Of course, such an attack would have to be low to the ground, and the airplanes would have to fly at a very low speed in order to achieve any effective result using this method, which would put the aircrew and plane in extreme danger from enemy fighters and ground crew, so no examples are really attempted. That is, until the German-based electronics manufacturer AEG put forward their design, the AEG J1. This biplane was fitted with two mounts which would face downward at a 45 degree angle allowing for the attachment of forward-facing machine guns to take out troops below. A hole in the right-hand corner of the cockpit would be used as an ad hoc site for the pilot, who would then relay to the rear gunner when to fire the fixed machine guns. The trigger foot was mounted as a pedal on the ground where the gunner would sit, so that he could fire the machine guns while fending off any possible attack from the air with the adjustable Parabellum MG-14 without too much trouble. However, to effectively assault ground troops, the airplanes would have to get reasonably close to the ground and fly slow enough for an accurate bombardment. To accommodate for the danger of small arms fire, the biplane was fitted with armor covering both the engine, the cockpit, and the gunner's position. These metal plates, although part of the original design, were attached in a crude fashion by simply attaching it to the framework rather than building it into the overall design. This may have been for an easier removal of the armor depending on the air mission it was flying with the armor only attached when it would fly ground attack missions, but there isn't enough documentation on the German side to know for sure, or if there was any covering behind the armor on most aircraft. The metal plates were a uniform 5.2 millimeters thick, or 0.2 inches. The total area of the armor was around 105.8 square feet and weighed a total of 860 pounds. The effectiveness of the armor is questionable as tests done on a badly damaged AEG J-1 shot down of May 1918 would show. These tests looked at the distance and angle of the shot in relation to the armor, and used both German armor piercing and the British variant, and the standard rounds of both nations. What it did end up showing, however, was in the absolute best case, the airplane had to be about 150 feet, or 50 yards, from the enemy to avoid the simple standard British rounds from going through the armor. To avoid armor piercing would require an attack from over 2,100 feet, or 700 yards, to avoid being damaged by British armor piercing rounds. Powered with a 200 horsepower Benz engine, the airplane was woefully underpowered by 1917 and especially 1918 standards giving it a top speed of only 150 kilometers per hour, or 93 miles per hour, and a paltry range of 375 kilometers, or 233 miles. Without the armor, this speed increases to a more reasonable 172 kilometers per hour, or 107 miles per hour, and the range almost doubles to 590 kilometers, or 366 miles. With such a low speed and limited range, the combat record of the AEGJ is not great, Quite a few were shot down by ground troops alone, and the aircraft was unable to hold up on its own against enemy fighters. Even still, the few that were operational in the spring of 1918 took part in the spring offensive, with many being shot down as the German Air Force didn't have enough fighters to properly cover for them while they committed to their ground attacks. Interestingly enough, the aircraft offered the perfect platform for experiments being carried out by the Sturm Battalion 16 in early 1918 and they began working with Flieger Appetit Long 223 to create an aerial flamethrower, succeeding in March. I have a video going over this very subject you can check out here. Deliveries of the J-2 began in early 1918. This new model had better flight controls and was more stable in the air when compared to the J-1. By the end of the war, around 160 AEG J-1s had been built, along with 230 J-2 variants. These numbers were, are disputed with some reports putting 300 J-1s and only 106 J-2s, and still others claiming over 600 AEG J-type aircraft were made. 
although this is probably including the Junkers and Albatross armored biplanes using the same name. Regardless, only 28 AEG J1 and 63 J2 types were left operational at the time the armistice was signed. This is an astounding 75% loss rate if we're going to take these numbers at face value. After the war, the Allies confiscated many of the aircraft, with some eventually falling into the hands of various civil operators in Germany. A total of 18, in fact, all of which being the later J-2 model. Many of these, around 13 in total, were operated by the airline Deutsche Luft Riederei, which would eventually become Lufthansa. While two were scrapped in 1920, the rest continued flying for the airline throughout the 1920s, being converted into both mail and passenger carriers for the airline, with the passenger variant having the capacity for two people in the pilot initially. While these aircraft at the start were open cockpit, they eventually had their entire fleet redesigned to have an enclosed cabin. Improvements were also made to its performance, switching out the engine for a 230 horsepower Benz and increasing the fuel capacity while also removing the armor. This new variant was then called the AEG Cabina, sometimes written down as the AEG J2K, or simply the AEG K. Cabina obviously standing for cabin, as that's what was included in this new design, an enclosed cabin. Slowly the fleet would dwindle as accidents took them out of service. Four in total would crash between 1923 and 1928, with the worst coming on June 14, 1928, when a crash near Frankfurt would take the lives of five people. Of the remaining nine, two were sent to Adria Aero Lloyd in 1925, an Albanian airline formed upon the nation's newfound independence. Two more were put out of service and scrapped in 1926 and 1928 respectively. One was sent to the Reich's Ministry of Transport, and another was lost in a fire in 1932. The fate of the two sent to Adrida, the one remaining in Lufthansa service, and the one given to the Reich Ministry of Transport is unknown. It is suspected that the Albanian ones were scrapped once the airline was absorbed by the Italian-based Aero Express in 1934, and the, examples kept by the minist- and the example kept by the Ministry of Transport was most likely destroyed sometime during the Nazi regime for raw materials or as a byproduct of World War II's destruction. There are no known surviving examples of the aircraft remaining, and no known reproductions exist. Even still, there is also the unknown fate of the five kept in miscellaneous private hands within Germany, as well as the one that did remain in Lufthansa's hands post-1930. It is likely many of these were wrecked or scrapped in the 30s, and the other ones were more than likely destroyed during the war. Thank you all for watching this video, and I hope that you guys enjoyed. My apologies for the past few videos having pretty inconsistent audio quality at best. I'm just now getting back into making videos and trying to figure out what was working before as some of the items that I was using aren't exactly available to me anymore. So I'm sort of starting from scratch again in the recording department. But it won't be long before I make the necessary adjustments to properly have a system that is having consistent and good quality audio. If you guys enjoyed the video, please leave a like, a comment, and it kind of helps out with the YouTube algorithm if you do that. Share to people that might that you think might find this interesting, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to be doing this a lot more. I said that in the past three videos, but these are going to be weekly videos now about interesting bits of aviation history from the late 1800s all the way to 1918.